that uh, um, <laughs> my wife has used on numerous occasions when uh, when I have when she has actually sort of gone. So how many colonies do you actually have these days? Um, and I asked another beekeeper the same question a little while ago, and what made me laugh at the beginning of the season was she looked rather blankly at me, thought, started counting, and went, I'm not quite sure. And this is someone who's only ever had two or three colonies. And I, I turned around to her and said, you're a proper beekeeper now because you've no idea how many colonies you are. It can go that way. Your numbers can grow. That can be a good thing. And a lot of the stuff that you'll read in books and that you're reading in, in sort of magazines and things like that will tell you about making increase, about how to increase your numbers, about how to build colonies up. But there is a limit. And let's just try and look at some of the, the reasons that, that kind of increasing is easy and then go on to sort of the flip side of that coin. So as we'll all know very well this year, bees have a strong impulse to swarm. It's they're, they're hardwired to do it. Most colonies will have a go at it unless there's something, unless that colony's quite weak or it's diseased or it's got a, a queen that may be new and, and, and really kind of prolific. Um, but most colonies will have a go at it in a year. I'd probably say two thirds or even more. Now we'll try and do what we can to stop that. And we've got ways and means of, of trying to stop that process. But a lot of those ways and means mean dividing the colonies. And as we divide the colonies, you can end up with that situation where this year I've talked to several people who started with one colony and already those they're up to three. And some people I've talked to are even up to five colonies from that single starting point this year. Now that's unusual. But that's been a steep learning curve for quite a few people in their first year. So it's that's the sort of thing you have to deal with. And it presents challenges. And we'll look at some of what those challenges are. OK, so what is the problem with having too many bees? Um, many people would would see it as, as a blessing or a benefit, um, but I'm not always sure it is. There's a downside to it as well. Some of the aspects um, that I think are problematic about it are that um, there's a time commitment involved. Now estimates that over a year a colony will probably take you time wise 20 to 40 hours. So each colony you've got in a year is going to take you getting on for a working week's worth of, of time. If you start adding that up into multiples and you start getting up to 10 colonies or 20 colonies or even five colonies, that's quite a lot of time. That's more than your annual leads. That's a lot of weekends. That's a lot of evenings. Now, it's a significant time commitment and we've all got busy lives. There's a lot of juggling we have to do. That can get tricky. Um, so that's one of the issues. Space is another issue. We can start in our gardens or our allotments, or but we could quite easily outgrow those. And if we try and keep too many colonies in that one space, that's going to create problems. It could create problems of nuisance for people nearby. It could create problems um, in terms of forage for the bees. You pack too many bees in one area, two colonies will thrive. Eight colonies might really have a tough time. We see some evidence of this in the city centres. London has for several years been saying there's just too many beekeepers and too many bees in central London. There isn't enough forage and the bees aren't doing well. We're kind of seeing a little bit of evidence of that in Newcastle where when we keep the bees at Summerhill, they tick over and they do fine. Are they ever great honey producers? No, and it's not always about the colonies. Sometimes it's about the amount of forage. So I, I suspect there is a there is a carrying capacity in a city. If you get too many bees and you haven't got enough time, then those colonies can get neglected and the welfare of those colonies can suffer, um, which is a shame. So that's something that ideally we want to avoid. We've briefly touched on nuisance. 
too many bees in one spot in an urban area could cause problems even if the bees are good natured you sooner or later will miss a queen cell there'll be a swarm you'll freak out some neighbors it's just one of those one of multiple elements that just mean just have a think about it um if you're a little bit lacking in experience and your numbers grow very quickly you can sometimes find yourself a little bit out of your depth um and you're not maybe having the confidence to know what to do and when to do it now we'll always try and back you up and support you as much as we can but it's just another of the things that that features the impacts of swarming are not only on you but there are on other people i think that's worth remembering so just as your numbers grow if you're happy with it great but just make sure those around you have a similar kind of way because you don't want to end up really stressed and beekeeping can be stressful at times it's not always that nice lovely pastoral relaxing hobby that everyone thinks it can sometimes do your head in a little bit um and if you're tearing around with work and things like that that can that can sort of not be terribly pleasant cost is another aspect um more bees means more kit and more spare kit that can be an issue um it, it's not always the cheapest of hobbies what worries me sometimes is the number of beekeepers who give up especially in the first couple of years for all sorts of reasons some very personal some sort of that you can see coming sometimes because people lose their bees but i think too many can be one factor so always we'd rather people had a sustainable beekeeping experience rather than one that exploded in the first couple of years and then they pack it up so the working out what your capacity is for colonies um means that you need to have a think about it everybody's going to have a different answer and yours will be an individual answer but it starts with planning in the winter how many would you like how many do you think you can practically cope with how many more importantly do you think you can properly as, as an individual or if you've got a bee buddy as a little group care for properly and again how many is there forage for in any one area have a think about those and be realistic because it's very easy if you come through a season with quite a lot of colonies just to go oh well well just see how it goes that's not really planning that's a bit of wishful thinking and it can lead to issues the following year which are avoidable so what can't we actually do anything about what's outside of our control well the weather is certainly one of them um this little graphic illustrates losses um, of honeybees over the last um, uh, 10 years or so. The BBKA's annual winter survival, winter loss survey, as they now call it. As you can see, it's very variable. Losses at their lowest extent are a bit below 10%. Losses at their worst are over a third in a year. Now, when you're thinking about how many colonies you're going to keep through a winter how many you're going to kick off with next spring you can't actually control that element but you do have to be aware of it how you factor that in is obviously something that you need to think about for yourself but you know what just keep it in the back of your mind in spring this is our opportunity to look at how many colonies we've successfully come through winter with you may have an opportunity in spring to unite some colonies you, you're a bit worried that one of them hasn't really come through properly the queen doesn't seem early in the season to be as prolific or as strong as you wanted do you know what if you've got if you're on the edge of having too many maybe instead of waiting it to, to struggle all the way through the spring and into the early summer maybe make a decision to to sort of uh, unite it then but the key thing in spring is swarm prevention so if you don't want to have double the number of colonies by may or june let's have a look at swarm prevention 
So one of the key aspects of, uh, of swarm pr prevention is to prevent overcrowding. In a hive, when it gets overcrowded, the queen substance that the queen gives off that keeps the colony loyal to her gets diluted in an overcrowded colony. It can't get around as easily. Excuse me, while the phone goes off. Um, if you add supers, sometimes you can take brood out of that colony. Sometimes you could add a box of foundation um, or do some comb changes. All of those things, shook swarms, things like that may help prevent the overcrowding, give the bees a, an activity, give them space, keep them busy, keep them from thinking about swarming. The other aspect of, of kind of uh, swarm prevention is younger queens. If your queens are two, three years old, Again, they're not producing as much queen substance as when they were younger. They may start thinking about swarming. If um, you need to be checking, this year was especially early. I mean, sort of sometimes you don't up here get you get a chance to get into um, into the bees until late April and even early May because the weather's just awful. This year colonies were already on double brood and needed splitting by the end of April. So from early April on, depending on the weather as always, you need to be checking on to weekly checks for your colonies um, because they w could be making swarm preparations and you need to ideally be a, a step ahead of that. The other thing that you'll have heard me bang on again and again about is um, enough spare equipment. The thing that catches so many people out so often and it's the one thing you really can do something about is when the sales are on in January when you've got a little bit of spare time over the winter months buy some cheap kit build it have it ready there is nothing that will raise your blood pressure more than having a swarm hanging out of a tree and you haven't even ordered let alone built your new kit um, because when you need it you need it there and then you can make life a bit easier for yourself but also that you can anticipate what's going to happen you know that those colonies are going to come out of eight uh, out of winter and by april they're going to be increasing dramatically you hope when you see sign when you see drones in a hive a colony's never going to swarm until there are drones around because it will be pointless they can't reproduce drones are an early indicator that swarming is heading your way if you see a spring honey flow like oil seed rape or something like that there's going to be a lot of nectar coming in the bees are going to start thinking hey it could get a bit crowded or b hey this could be an opportunity we should th start thinking about so a spring honey flow can trigger swarming thoughts the first thing you'll be able to see is some queen cups play cups being built that's not an issue if there's a few of those in your hive each time you look, that's just nature. That's what they're going to do. If you start seeing those cups with eggs in, or for me, I have a threshold. If I'm seeing about 10 new queen cups every time I go into a hive, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to divide that hive. It's just a rule of thumb that I think kind of is a useful one of, of the threshold that you can be pretty sure if you're seeing that that hive sooner or later is going to swarm. And of course, if you see charred queen cells, and by that I mean an extended queen cell with royal jelly and a larvae in it, that means they're going to go, and they're going to go really soon. And then we go into the next thing, which is swarm control. So swarm prevention, all the nice things that you've done that people have told you will stop them swarming fail, and that happens more often than not, you're going to end up with that charged queen cell in, in your colony or multiple charged queen cells in that colony. Now, the line in the middle that says, repeat after me, knocking down queen cells is not swarm control. I'm not joking. It's not swarm control. You will miss a cell. The minute you put the lid on, they will draw more queen cells. It's not swarm control. You might think it is, but it's not going to work, they'll go. Now the life cycle is that from an egg being laid to a queen cell being sealed, which is the trigger point for a swarm, is eight and a half days. 
However, that's the reason that we do seven day inspections. So we're in there before the queen cells are sealed. But they can make a queen cell on a larvae up to three days old. So that means you've lost six days of those eight and a half. So they can raise a queen cell and seal it within three days. So if that colony is really primed to go, you want to find a lot more opportunities to check that colony than every seven days because you, otherwise you're going to get swarms. And once you get a swarm, again, with, if you catch it, great, but you've, you've got an extra colony. And the purpose of this is not to talk about swarm control, but it's to talk about not increasing your numbers. Now, most of the forms of swarm control, Pagden, Snellgrove, Newt Methods, Demarie, will all normally take you into having extra colonies. However, there is an alternative. If you, in the colony that you think is about to swarm or is showing signs of swarming, if you just remove the queen, you've removed one of the key aspects of swarming and you don't need to create a separate colony. Now you may really like that queen, in which case you don't want to go down that route. But if the queen's a bit suspect for whatever reason or a bit old, taking the queen out and letting the colony regenerate means that you just stay with the one colony and you haven't divided it. If you do go for one of the other methods of swarm control, beware that you what you may have to do is after you've initially gone in, found queen cells, thinned it down to one queen cell, you may have to do that more than once. Because once you've thinned it down, if there's still eggs or young larvae in there, they'll build more queen cells. So just watch out because you what is a real pain is if you get lots and lots of little cast swarms that you each have to a, catch and then you have to find a, a box for. They're small, they're often not very viable, they're often not much use, but they're taking up your kit and they're an extra colony that you'll, you might put a time and effort into. You can avoid that by thinning the queen cells down at more than one time during the time that, between those queen cells being started and the first queen emerging. The other thing to watch out for is, as many people have found this year, colonies have swarmed on at least two occasions and some, for some people even more. So it's been a long season, that's been an unusual feature. It doesn't always happen, but it is an aspect that we need to kind of just keep in mind. In summer, equipment is at a premium. You've never got enough. You always kind of wish you bought a bit more and made a bit more, but there are ways of bringing kit back. If you divided a colony, you've done an artificial swarm, you had it on, and say, two brood boxes. At some point, that colony before the new queen's laying, it's going to diminish, it's going to shrink back. There's an opportunity for you to move all the brood into one brood box, maybe even take a super off, extract the honey. You can pull you can pull equipment back into circulation for swarms that come along later. Also having a few nuke boxes in your armory can make, oh, apologies for my spelling, um, can make really good temporary homes for colonies that you haven't got a full hive for. So just balance up your equipment. Don't leave it all kind of sitting on a hive, not, not earning its keep. If you can reuse it, if you can pull it off and reuse it. Now, if you are reusing it, obviously, be aware, don't spread disease around from one disease colony to another. So be confident that those colonies are disease free before you start bringing equipment or sterilize it first. Now, in the, one of the key things, and there's a little video I've put up on, um, on uh, Facebook um, that I made the other day with a couple of dummy hives about doing a paper unite. Because a paper unite done late in the season is probably your most effective tool for reducing the number of colonies you've got. It's really simple. It involves having the colony you want to keep and the colony that you aren't so keen on. Now, this is where records can come in because if you've got a few colonies, it's worth having a look through your, your back records and deciding why it is that you're not so keen on that colony and what it is about it. that Has it been a bit temperamental? 
as it really struggled, if you had no honey off it for a couple of years, there can be lots of different reasons. The key thing is to make a decision. It's easy to procrastinate and go, oh, well, I'll just, I'll give it a chance. And, and no, if you want to keep your colony numbers under control, you've got to make some tough decisions. Uniting, hopefully, will strengthen your, the colony that you've chose to unite to. Because the key thing of overwintering bees successfully is more bees. Bees, when they cluster in the winter, reduce their surface area. The more bees there are, the more efficient that cluster is and the better their survival chances. So if you choose to unite, you can always split again in the spring. Don't tr maybe spend too much effort on trying to get colonies that have struggled all season through winter. Increase your odds. Um, because remember, what you're trying to avoid is going double, 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 double every year of, of colonies. It may not be worth trying to get some colonies through winter. If you want me to kind of give you a, a rough rule of thumb, is if I've got a colony that's come sort of August time and I'm looking at which ones to keep and which ones not, taking apart maybe colonies that have had late queens and are still building up fast, if a colony's really never made it above four frames, five frames of bees in a season, there's a question mark over whether it's worth giving that colony sort of a good opportunity through winter. So the, the phrase goes, take your losses in the autumn, not in the spring. So the paper unite method. Very often the lower box is the box that you want to keep and is queen right. It's got the queen you like in it. What you do is you need to take the queen out of the other colony because if you don't, it's unlikely to work. So you need to find her, and I know that's sometimes a challenge, but you do need to find her. You need to take her out. Um, the most easy way of euthanizing a queen is pop her in a matchbox or a container, pop her in the freezer. She'll chill and fall asleep and be euthanized fairly swiftly. Um, it's not kind but it's as kind as you can make the process so the top colony is now queenless as you'll see in the picture if you've got a big enough screen um, this is one where the paper's been eaten away a couple of sheets of newspaper um, it's great if you can get the big broadsheet newspapers but there's very few of those around there so a couple of sheets of smaller newspaper will work the queen excluder is really only to hold the newspaper down because you can guarantee when you try and do this process, you'll do it on a windy day and the newspaper will be halfway across the garden before you've even started. You can use pins, but it, it tends to rip. Sheet of newspaper or two, queen excluder, upper box on top. What you can see in the upper little picture is that they'll chew through the newspaper over a few days and spit the newspaper out the front and the colonies meet slowly. They merge and their colony scents, their colony odours mingle without a hard introduction. And in, I've only ever seen two um, Unites in this kind of way uh, end up in fighting. It's a very simple method. It's a very effective method. What you'll need to do a week after you've started the process is you'll probably have brood in the lower box, brood in the upper box, what you want to do is probably try and remove the top box altogether. What you can do is you can salvage all the brood and move that down to the bottom box. If you've got some great frames of stores or some newer frames or things that are better in the top box than the bottom box, swap them for the things in the bottom box. So you can have a bit of a sort out. Be careful of your queen, obviously, in the bottom box because you don't want to do her any harm. If you've got supers on in... This, so you've got a super on the lower colony it really doesn't matter just as long as there's a barrier between the two colonies you might um, if you if you've got a super on and a queen excluder above say the lower brood box you might get some drones trapped in the super which you may need to work sort of work out but essentially the whole thing just works the same if you've got supers on you just need a divider between the two colonies So just to go over the Unite, it, the newspaper methods is most common. One of the colonies, normally the upper colony, should be queenless and shouldn't have gone to drone lane workers. 
because then you've got a problem and that won't resolve it. The weaker colony on top of the stronger one. The newspaper is the barrier. The newspaper, often you put a few tiny holes. I mean, like, I mean, when I say tiny holes, I mean with a nail. I don't mean big slashes with your hive tool because then they'll merge too quickly. It really is a few pricks in the, in the paper, nothing more. The bees will chew through the paper, very little fighting, leave it for a week, and then do as we, as we discussed, rearrange the frames between the boxes. Okay, so in autumn, excuse me just a sec. You want the colonies you've chosen to survive. So get them up, get them strong, do everything you can. That means they've got young queens, they're strong colonies, They've got plenty stores, 20 kilos plus of honey, and it, they're disease free. Because what you don't want to do is bring your numbers right down and then lose a bunch of them in the winter. So make sure the ones you're going to keep are, are able to do it. We've talked about winter losses um, varying from about 10 to 30 percent. So just keep that in your mind when you're choosing how many you keep. Remember that don't count your chickens too early if they make it through till Christmas time That's great, but they haven't seen the hard part of winter yet um, Most colonies will fail in February and March and that can be disappointing because you think you've got them through and you think you've got them through and you think they're nearly there and then they don't make it It's a shame, but that's 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 the way it goes um, Strong adapted well adapted disease free colonies will hopefully survive a winter. Uh, there's no guarantees, but if you've done everything right in the autumn, you've given them the best chance that you possibly can. If you've got a small colony and you want to try and get it through, I've not done it much myself, but give polynukes a try. The other way to keep your colony numbers down is to sell. So often early in the year, if you bring some colonies through winter, there's often a demand of people on the beekeeping courses who'd really like to get bees early in the year. So if you've overwintered a smallish colony or a colony from late, late last year that's got a new queen in it, you may find a demand. In June and July, when a lot of colonies tend to be available and swarms are available, that demand isn't as high. But in the early part of the year, so if you want to bring some colonies through with a view to that and another way of controlling your numbers, then be prepared to sell. Now, small beekeepers often aren't comfortable with selling because they've not done it before. They worry a bit about whether the quality of the bees and the queen and they're taking money from somebody and they don't want to shortchange them and they want everything to be right. Yeah, sure, there are standards that you need to meet and I can give you information about those standards, but keep it realistic. And there's nothing wrong with selling a couple of excess colonies each year. It'll help fund your beekeeping and it'll start new beekeepers off. And as I say, the demand in April, May time is much higher than it is later in the year. If you're on the swarm collectors list or you end up collecting swarms, either your own, you don't have to keep them all. You can give them away. There are often people who've had a difficult situation. Something went wrong in spring. A split they did didn't work out. Who've lost queens or something like that, who are only too willing to take a swarm from someone who's collected it. They may not have the confidence to collect a swarm themselves yet, but they may be very happy to take a swarm. So on our Facebook page or whatever it is, if you've got a swarm that you don't want to keep but would like to pass on, absolutely. We generally keep a list of people each year who are looking for swarms um, that will contact if one becomes available. But if you just want to post a message about that yourself, feel free. Just be wary of a couple of things. Swarms, the temperament and the disease set status aren't known. So you can't be sure of that and you should alert a new beekeeper to that that you can't give them any guarantees. You also can't sell swarms. If you try to sell a swarm to another beekeeper, um, your BBK uh, sort of public liability insurance becomes invalid. So you need to be careful of that because that's worth protecting. That's it for this first talk. If you'll uh, hang with me for just two seconds, I'll load up the next talk and uh, be right back with you.
Okay, now Pooh Bear is a very wise bear. And one of my favorite sayings of his is you never can tell with bees. <laughs> and he's really, really absolutely right there. Um, what bee behavior is, is, is a complicated thing. Um, so let's leave our friend for the moment. To take on a subject like bee behaviour is a little bit daunting and I really did think twice about um, even sort of stepping into this because I just thought what are people's expectations and what can you actually say? I will try and explain in the limited time we've got as much as I can but obviously this is a vast topic and we're not going to get through all of it. Um, the famous quote is that bees don't read the same books that we do. Um, so what we are led to believe that the, uh, a colony of bees will do in a season, they rarely do. I know from my own experience, once I was preparing some lecture notes um, and I looked for, looked back over sort of five or more years um, records of bees to try and find a colony that did all the typical things in a season. And I couldn't find it. It just didn't exist. But that's what the books will tell you is out there. Unfortunately, we have to adapt a little bit more than that. Um, the other thing is that however much we plan, the bees will keep us on our toes and our initial plan will probably go out of the window remarkably quickly. So we learn to adapt, we learn to cope, we learn to have plan A, plan B, plan C and several other backup plans as well. However, if you can grasp some principles of bee behaviour, it's going to really help you to read a colony. Now again, anything that you see written down about bees will have exceptions. And this is part of the reason why when you ask the, another famous quote, ask three beekeepers, get at least four different opinions. Because there are so many exceptions. It depends on your bees, in your situation, in that particular year, with all these variables. And with all those variables, it, it, there are things that you can anticipate, but there are things that you just have to be aware may just happen. Um, bees often ignore what they're supposed to do and do something weird, something entirely else. And that is, in some ways things not being normal is normal um, however are they just being awkward or is there an underlying something that we're not quite getting from what they're doing a lot of the time there might well be they are a super organism and what I mean by super organism is uh, people describe that the collection of bees that an individual bee is almost like a cell and the colony is almost like a, a living animal in itself so the superorganism is is the collective part of it and the way they work together is is very complicated and it's not always easy to kind of uh, understand what's going on there however in the time we've got this evening, um, I like the phrase from Dick Cheney, who used to be a US Secretary of State. It's, uh, there are no knowns, there are things that we know that we know. However, there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. I'm going to stick to the, what we know, because there's too much of the other stuff. So let's stick to it, some facts, and maybe another day there's the conjecture on all the things that, that kind of and that's where research comes in and hopefully explains some stuff so what are the influences on on bee behavior so the cast of bee worker queen um drone obviously has a major impact on their individual and collective uh what they do because the cast do very different jobs and have very different functions internally Bees as, as individuals and as groups have hormones which develop over time, glands which develop over time. So bees that are a couple of days old clean the house because they can't sting, so they're no good as guards or soldiers. 
we've got genetics as we all know genetics can have an influence over bees temperament and other aspects of bees life now there's a big nurture nature debate about how much it's the colony that decides on behavior and how much it's genetics the reality is it's a balance of both but bees have a strong survival instinct they want to survive very often people kind of worry that that kind of a colony has gone queenless very often that colony will right itself their survival instinct is incredibly strong they do not want to fade out it will happen but colonies are very smart so if you're just about to give up on a colony because you think you're absolutely sure it's queenless after a split and it's not going to come right give it another few days and the chances are you'll see eggs and it will come right so along a eusocial species is is similar to, to what we were talking about a minute ago they work as this big collaborative collective um, and they do uh, express that in self-sacrifice so guard bees soldier bees will sting you or sting something else to defend the greater good um, to defend the, the good of the hive that's the that's the way they're wired bee behavior externally can be varied by an awful lot of things um, season and weather are probably the the most obvious things but within the collective itself the pheromones and the communication and the dances that they use are all very integral influences on on how bees behave so looking at population population is a type of behavior um, bees go through this what's this this uh, described as a bell curve um, the numbers will peak in June ish uh, and are on the way down by now that's what bees do uh, it's that sharp build up March April into May swarming often mid May onwards as they reach the peak and then kind of uh, the calming down bees survive as a as a species um, uh, as a colony over winter primarily because they can take advantage of early year forage when other species haven't built up that's that that's their that's their niche in life um, so that's that's where they they kind of benefit most so that's their their population behavior we know that and when we're looking at swarm control and things like that that's what we have to or making a hive increasing it in size that's what we have to take into account now the bee behavior of, of work bees um, or it's, it's also age-related labor if you want to give it a technical term it's polyethism basically a bee's life is bro broken down into two blocks the first 21 days as a house bee first couple of days naught to three is a cleaning bee just cleaning out the cells getting them ready for a new egg to be laid days three to nine feeding and nursing the brood days nine to 18 and as they the reasons that bees do have these well-defined kind of uh, time slots is because as, as a bee grows glands develop which means it physically is capable of doing these different things wax glands will develop sting glands will develop which they don't straight from being uh, emerging from 9 to 18 days they ripen honey they cap cells they can make wax um, they can build comb they get involved in ventilation and evaporation of, of moisture out of the honey and keeping the temperature of the hive right from 18 to 21 days just on the cusp of, of changing to being a forager the uh, the young workers become guards at 21 days until their death which is approximately 42 days in summer um, adult bees are foragers now a small percentage of those foragers are, are, the, are the kind of smart ones I guess if you want to put it that way and they're the scouts um, who go out will find a source of forage and then we'll come back and dance or alert other bees to, to the presence of that forage and where it is many of the other bees will will follow that lead and bees as adult foragers nectar and pollen kind of tend to overlap 
but water and propolis tend to be specialist activities by smaller numbers of bees. Now in times of need, they'll recruit other bees to bring in water, but there'll be a kind of core workforce of water bees all the time. The feedback loops that go in on within colonies to communicate the needs of the colony are complex uh, and very clever as part of the communication. There's a simple rule that a lot of people sometimes use, uh, which is a rule of threes with, with kind of like um, with bee life. So three days an egg, three weeks a house bee, um, or a for and then three weeks a forager. Drone's lifespan is three months and the queen's lifespan is three years plus. It's a, it's a sort of simple little monomic. Mating behaviour. Okay, so a new queen uh, is started in your hive and it's a desirable thing that you've let happen. So 16 days after she's kicked off as an egg, um, she will emerge from her queen cell. She takes five days to become mature. If you've ever seen a virgin queen in a hive, virgin queens are really hard to spot because their abdomens haven't extended uh, in the way they have once they've been mated. So their shape looks fractionally different, fractionally more pointy in the abdomen, but really looks a bit like a worker. Her legs are still a different colour, but they're darn hard to spot. So after five days, she's mature and the bees will, the workers will harass her to leave the hive. They don't want her around. As she matures, her pheromones will start to develop and they will get her to, to kind of literally harass her out of the hive to get mated because she's got a finite pay, pay, period of time. After about three and a half weeks or so, um, the queen's spermatheca physically changes and she can't store the sperm from the drones in the same way anymore. So she will basically be a failed or a weak queen from that point on. So she has a finite period of time to mate. She'll go out on several mating flights um, in the early days of her life. Um, it, it may be just one, but it can be several. Um, she will go to a drone congregation area um, and she will often be escorted there by an entourage of bees now the queen gives out strong pheromones which are attractive to the drones who will follow her now drone congregations are often 10 to 40 meters up in the air they can be 100 meters in diameter and there can be tens of thousands of drones in a drone congregation area and the reasons they happen in certain places are still something that science doesn't fully understand um, but they exist i've never seen one myself but other people have and they and they can be kind of mimicked up um, with a drone on the, with a queen on the end of a fishing rod. Um, the queen gives out the scents, the drones mate with her. The queens are polygamous, so they mate with at least uh, half a dozen drones. Often the average is 13. It can be up to 60. So there's multiple father lines in the in the worker population uh, of the colony from that point on. What do drones do? Not a lot. They stick around, they eat a lot of honey, um, they mate with the queen, which is their major purpose. They're physically different because their sole mating purpose means that the large eyes means they spot a queen in a drone congregation area before the rest. And their big muscly thorax is so they've got strong muscles so they can catch her, fly quickly and catch her. Because it's the first one in the queue who gets to mate with the queen. Um, life for a drone has many drawbacks. One is being kicked out in autumn. Uh, the other is as soon as you mated with the queen, basically uh, your genitals explode and uh, that's it for you, boy. Um, there you go. That's the life of a drone. Queen laying behavior. When the queen's mated, she'll come back to the hive. She, as I say, she may take a couple of mating flights um, but once she's back, that's it. And a few days later, four days is an average, she'll start um, laying eggs. One thing to watch when you first see eggs in new brood, um, new brood, sort of, sorry, new, when you first see new eggs, and you think, great, a queen, and then you see a couple of eggs in a cell, and you go, oh no, it must be drone laying workers, there's more than one egg in a cell. 
queens when they first start laying haven't quite got the hang of it always so if it's only two eggs and they're right at the bottom of the cell it's probably just the queen getting into the swing of laying and knowing being able to differentiate how much she's laying now once queens are up and laying young queens can often lay 1500 maybe more eggs a day but obviously there's a wide seasonal variation a young queen will often go laying eggs later into a season than a, than a year old or two year old queen because they know they've got to get that colony up to strength again so fertilized eggs and the queen can make a conscious well i'm not sure how conscious it is the queen makes a decision when she lays an egg to fertilize it or not the fertilized eggs take become workers the unfertilized eggs become drones but the queen has some process of working out the ratios of so drones shouldn't in a normal colony with a healthy queen be a, a made majority of the population they should be a small minority queen egg laying will reduce with age um, by year three she's often kind of a, a shadow of a former self and that's when people often suggest that queens might want to be retired at about that age Drone eggs, likewise, as the queens lose fertility as they become older, um, they may the drone population of the hive can increase as the, the eggs that the queen lays become increasingly unfertilized. Social behaviour. So we've talked about how bees are a eusocial species. We've talked about how they work as a superorganism. So within a, within a colony, as you most often, most likely already know, queen is one normally very occasionally you'll get overlapping queens in a process called perfect supersedure but most of the time it's one queen about one percent of the population of a hive is drone that can be a little bit higher in some populations in some colonies it varies a bit but on average and workers are about 99 percent of the of the population we've talked about the division of labor by age and by caste and we talked a little bit about how the feedback loops of their pheromones and their dances very carefully identify what the colony needs to be able to survive, to keep the temperature right, to keep the food supply coming in, to keep the colony healthy, to evaporate the moisture off, to, keep, to, to get the winter stores ready. Very complex communications needed and a lot of instinct goes into that complex process. There's processes like worker policing, where um, in a normal hive with a queen, if workers find uh, work other workers that have laid eggs, and that is a process that does happen in a normal colony, they'll remove them. I mean, they physically just eat them. There are democratic processes if a swarm happens. Um, when that first stage of a swarm leaving and, and resting up in a tree, that's not just them being a bit lazy and kind of going, hang on, guys, let's have a little rest. That's them actually stopping, sending out multiple scouts to scout out loca possible locations. If you read Tom Seeley's Honeybee Democracy, you'll get a good idea of this process. The bees come back. They dance on the outside of the hive in a similar way that they would if they found nectar and pollen. They recruit other bees to go and check out this great new home they've, they've, they're suggesting. And increasingly numbers will go towards one decision and then they'll all up and leave for that new home queen replacement is another social behavior of the bees they do it the queen doesn't decide to leave the workers decide to replace the queen so it's a collective democratic process again defense likewise the pheromones that the, the alarm pheromones that get circulated within a colony lead to the self-sacrifice of soldier bees who will come out and attack you if you're in, in a bad bad having a bad day or other sort of um predators who are attacking a hive again a social behavior so foraging foraging is a critical activity and a behavior for the bees because without it they starve so foraging, as we've already said, is the last three weeks of an adult's life. That three mile radius that's often talked about um, of bees uh, foraging adds up to a big area. It's 285 square miles, I'm told. That's a big area to forage within. Um, so you can imagine how much 
even in an urban area, even in a fairly built up urban area, that's quite a lot of, uh, of, um, of space to look around in. We've talked about bees being specialists and some bees being generalists. So nectar and pollen bees tend to be generalists and will switch a little bit between the two. Water and propolis tend to be specialist activities. But if there's a need or suddenly there's a loss, if bees, if suddenly colony, all the foragers get poisoned, the younger bees will step up before their age would specify because they recognize the colony needs and they will go out and start foraging. They might not be very good at it, but they will try and fill a gap. And we've also mentioned a little bit about the scout bees, the kind of smarter ones who will go out and seek new sources and will then come back and communicate that information to the bulk of the workers about where to, uh, where to find, which makes the process more efficient. If all the bees were going out scouting, then they would waste a lot of time. So it's, 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 it's a great process for kind of being yeah, effective and efficient. So defensive behaviour, it's a specific age of bees from about 18 to 21 days. Their sting glands have developed. They can actually physically defend. And you get, as in the picture, this very distinctive posture where it's kind of a bit like bouncers at the door of a nightclub. Um, sort of stood up, chest out, head, head up, sort of antennae kind of uh, pointing forward, challenging bees who come in. And they will sense the bees and sniff the bees and make antennal contact with the bees to work out if that's a friendly bee just coming home or it's a bee of, of kind of another colony which may not be welcome if they find a bee that's not welcome they will put out an alarm pheromone they may fight with it to kind of deter it coming in now there's a lot of things that will affect the um the aggressiveness or the defensiveness of a colony You'll have come across some of them, I'm sure. You go into the colony at the wrong, on a bad day, the weather's not great, it's wet, it's cold, all the bees have been bored and stuck at home. Or you go in too early or too late, or you go in at a time when um, the, 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 the good flow's just finished, bees can be tetchy. So there are reasons why bees can be tetchy in the short term. There are also genetics involved where bees can be uh, unpleasant, and that's to do with parental... Um, uh, sort of lines now you can try and do something about that you can try and not breed from the, the colonies that sting you every time you go to them and maybe let that be less kind of keen and it can be another of your selection criteria when you're trying to thin colonies down if they're horrible do you really want to be putting up with that colony next year or would it be better to take the queen out of it Unite it to a nice friendly colony. Use the bees to support another colony. Now they might still be a bit rubbish for a while, but they'll they'll get another colony through winter, and by next spring, hopefully that col that it won't have had any negative influence on what was a nice colony, except give it a better chance of survival. Your handling as well of bees can affect bees' behaviour. So if they're being defensive, look at all the external reasons, but also just reflect to yourself was it nasty after you did whatever was it nasty because you over smoked it just have a think about that swarming behavior now here's a biggie and I, again i'm not going to go through swarming as a, as a kind of major topic because it's a huge topic in itself but it's how a super organism reproduces on an individual level queen lays eggs eggs hatch out into bees but as a super organism, a swarm is like a, is like a cell dividing. Suddenly from one, there are two. And in uh, so evolution, that in, in, increases your survival chances if one becomes two. We've talked about those factors earlier in swarming. So congestion, the season, the strain of bees. Some bees are more swarmy than others. Age of queen weather, flow, if the hive gets very hot, um, those can all be factors in swarming. And we talked about the queen substance in, in uh, circulation being critical, and that's very relevant if a hive is overcrowded or a queen is old. The one thing that's hard to do is once a colony has decided it's going to swarm, it will start making preparations. 
So your swarm prevention like of giving space and things like that has to start quite early because once a colony has made up its mind it's going to swarm. It starts to thin down the queen, it feeds her less, she'll start laying less eggs, at which point it's kind of on a trajectory to swarm and it's really hard to make it change its mind. You can by doing an artificial swarm but often not much short of that will change its mind. There are other things that can cause um, swarms um, or absconding probably is a better term. If a colony is badly diseased, if it can't control the temperature or if you chuck a swarm in on, um, on the foundation and it goes, pa, really don't like this very much, they can abscond and you'll just come back and the hive will be empty. It's different to a swarm but you still can get the, the same result, a bunch of bees hanging out of a tree. We've talked a little bit about multiple queen cells being produced. So swarm cells often don't happen individually. There'll often be lots of them. And why knocking down swarm cells isn't a solution is that they'll build more and sooner or later you will miss one. A primary swarm is the old mated queen leaving with often 60% to 70% of a wide variation of all the casts and ages of bees. Secondary swarms, or also known as casts, are if you don't thin down the queen cells and a bunch of virgin queens hatch out and they don't fight and kill each other, then you'll get these small little casts coming out of a hive, which can be very small indeed and are often not viable. The other kind of twist to um, swarming behaviour is supersedure. Now this often happens from now, often into August, into September, where you'll often get maybe one, but certainly only a number less than five queen cells, very central in the brood patch. Um, few of them, central position, nice big cells, and then you have to make a decision, is there something wrong with that queen that they've decided to replace her? Now this might still result in a swarm, but it might result in a handover between mother and daughter queen. And from time to time, you will come across a colony and you go, oh look, there's the queen. Oh look, there's the other queen. And that's called perfect supersedure. And sooner or later, the older queen just goes. So not long to go now, we're kind of moving towards the end of this. Swarm behavior, as we've said, is a two stage process. The swarm leaves, rest nearby and the second stage scouts out finds its permanent new home hopefully not in next door's chimney their ideal home what they're searching for in this behavior is they want and if you read tom seeley he'll give you more on this a 40 litre void two to five meters up in the air which is white from trees and a small bottom entrance if you set bait hives beware of packing all the bait hives with with old frames because if scout bees go into that and they can't what scout bees will actually do and i was talking to someone a little while ago who actually physically heard this he was watching scout bees going into a bait hive and he could hear them bumping off the edges they measure the inside of the space to see how big it is if they can't do that because it's full of frames they may just move on and decide that that wasn't big enough Seasonal behaviour is, is another key thing. It's a nice trick if you can pull it off to expend, extend your lifespan times four between summer and winter, which is essentially what they do. A six week lifespan in the summer and a six month lifespan in the winter. They need to be very, very careful about how warm that brood is. If you've ever had any sort of hive monitors um, in your hive, you will see when there's brood in a hive, they will keep that brood at an almost perfect 34 degrees. And they have to work darn hard to do that because sometimes the outside temperature, well, especially in the northeast of England, is not 34 degrees. So the bees are in the, the brood's in the center. The cluster is round the bees. Sometimes when you see empty cells in a what's a good brood pattern, those aren't just ones that they've missed or whatever. It's often thought that those, uh, for, specifically for bees to go in they can dislocate their uh, flight muscles and vibrate instead of use the, use their wings that generates heat and that's what those empty cells are for 
Bees will cluster at temperatures around 14 degrees. Um, egg laying will reduce during the winter. Um, can reduce to almost nothing, which is why we use oxalic acid as a varroa treatment around Christmas time because there should be no eggs. Therefore, it's the most effective time to use that treatment. At seven degrees, if bees are on the outside of the cluster um, or the cluster gets below seven degrees, um, that, that means that the bees can't survive. However, the external temperature of a hive, uh, the outside temperature um, can drop really low, minus 35. I mean, I kept bees in the very, very cold winters 10 years ago up here when I was first starting out and the temperatures were regularly for, a month, for literally a month, six weeks, minus 10, minus 15, even in the daytime. Funnily enough, it panicked me, but the bees were fine and they, they survived, no problem. Damp kills bees, cold doesn't. As long as there's enough bees, cold won't have a huge impact. Bees physically change also in the winter. They've got fat bodies. Those kind of are where the winter stores are kept. Um, they also can, uh, if you ever dissect a bee um, in the early part of the year, boy, that bee is full of poo and desperate to go out. It, it, there is, their, their whole abdomen is, is basically one big sack of poo by that time of year. Sorry, if you're having your tea. Nearly at the end. Bees respond to pathogens. Um, we can help bees with, with pathogens. Pathogens are normally damaging to bees. They can cause changes to bees' behaviour. So the colony won't do well. Their lifespan will be shortened. Their brain ability, cognitive ability, or ability to fly, or just the number of bees, all those factors can be affected um, by pathogens. But bees can also respond. A lot of people are putting a lot of work into hygienic bees um, who will attack Varroa or who will groom Varroa off them or they will go into the cells and find Varroa on brood and throw the brood out. So bees behaviour can be proactive to, to help do them, do them some good. The whole point of propolis in a hive and why they work quite hard to bring that sticky stuff back is that uh, it's very antibacterial. So effectively they're building a sterile cocoon within their hive. So they're aware of their need for health and their behaviour responds to it. And finally, we'll talk a, a tiny bit about learning behaviour. How do bees learn? Some of it is instinct. Some of it is nurture. Um, they learn from their other bees. They learn from the hive community. They learn from scouts. They learn from the communications. They learn a lot through the process of trophallaxis, which is if you see two bees, meeting they'll often greet their antenna will touch they will swap honey and they're telling a, a huge amount of information about the outside environment in those in those communications there's a lot of information being passed from b to b colony odors pheromones are another kind of learning aspect of bees of how they understand things they will also learn in a sort of sense that we might kind of uh, identify with when you see young bees especially if you've had a few cold uh, wet days in may june time and there are a lot of new bees hatching out afterwards you get a warm day and you'll see all these bees doing this funny little backwards dance in front of the hive because they're kind of learning where the hive is and gradually taking a step back and a step back and a step back and then identifying the landmarks around that hive before they fly off they don't just go zooming out of the hive they need to know where home is. Bees can also be used by humans. Um, uh, we can train them with sugar syrup rewards to identify certain smells and they're used as, as to um, detect drugs and explosives in airports and things like that. Um, bees can also be used to um, sample, because bees go out over such a wide area, humans use them as environmental monitors because you can set li lots of little detectors all around a city or you can just collect a bunch of bees and look at what they've been foraging of and you get a decent idea of, of what the bees are about and what they've been doing. That's bees' behaviour. There are We talked at the beginning about there being this being a huge topic and there being so many behaviours which we're only going to kind of touch on the surface of. 
Washboarding is one classic behaviour where the bees come out, they stand on the side of the hive and they just go forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. They just, and no one knows what that's about. There's a few theories, but no one knows. It's fascinating to watch, but there's no explanation for it as, I, as far as I know. You have to only look back sort of 60, 70 years and the waggle dance was only dis discovered in the 50s. So there's, there's a huge amount of ongoing research. If you read people like Tom Seeley, there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment about finding new dances and new behaviours and understanding them and bringing them into the mainstream so we understand bees better. Because if we observe something, it's going to help us to know what the bees are after and how we can help manage them and, and manage them wisely. Some bees' behaviour is, is, is undoubtedly challenging and they will drive you crazy sometimes. Um, sometimes they appear to make very good decisions. Sometimes they appear to make utterly, utterly ridiculous decisions. I don't know. Some of those, some of those what might appear to be dumb decisions may have an underlying reason that we just don't get. Sometimes I think they're just being plain dumb. Um, but you have to deal with that as well as the logical stuff. Thank you hugely. Um, I've run slightly over our hour slot. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I hope you've enjoyed this session. It will be recorded. So if you want to watch back over it, um, be my guest. We'll meet again um, September the 8th. Uh, I hope you all stay safe and well. Until then, if you're able to get away this summer, terrific. Uh, I hope your beekeeping season has been reasonably successful. If you've got any questions, Bang them onto the Facebook page and I'll try and answer them as soon as I possibly can. Thanks ever so much, folks. I'm going to uh, end the, the video now.